I used to go to the job center and I would see like a set of doors in front of me and it would say skilled or unskilled. So I went through the skilled door. I saw another set of two doors. It said male or female. So I went through the male door and then I saw a final set of two doors and it said labor or conservative. And I went through the conservative door and I found myself back out on the street again, right? <laughs> Hello, Sunny Bonani, beautiful people. Welcome back to another episode. If you are new here, my name is Tenjiwe, and it is the month of October, which means it is the month to celebrate Black history. And on today's episode, we have a comedy genius, a person that I look up to, and I am so privileged, we are so privileged to have him here with us, to have him give us time to talk to us. Uh, on Black History Month, and please welcome Rudy Lockwood. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for for agreeing to do this. It means a lot to me. Okay. I wasn't even scared to ask you. Seriously, why? Yes, I was. I was like, why am I wasting his time? Who am I? Because you, you, you know, you are. We look up to you. I, I certainly look up to you, and I know a lot of people who do look up to you. You are a comedy legend. Yeah, that's because I'm. That's because I'm. I'm, I'm old. That's what it is. I'm, I'm old like time. Old like dust. <laughs> because of the work you've done, you've you've been on it. You you've worked, and you you continue to create spaces for other yeah. comedians as well. You've yeah. not just. Uh, done it and forgotten to bring other people up. You've brought so many people up and you're always celebrating other people as well. Well, I've, I've figured that that's the only way that um, we, we're going to grow as a people, really. And being of, um, uh, well, my parents are actually Guyanese, they're South American, so my parents came over. So I'm first generation in Britain. So the struggle of trying to make it and get ahead I'm very much aware of because of the system that I had to go through. Mm. And thank you so much because you, you are the godfather of comedy and you have, and you are one of the few that have broken through. Because when I first came here, coming from South Africa, I didn't understand that there was a different uh, comedy for black people in Britain, different comedy for white people. And then there's the mainstream and not many black comedians can cross over. And even within the black comedians, there's uh, Caribbean and there's African. That's true. That is so true. And I th the few that can do all rooms, you can do anything. Yeah, I mean, when you've when you've grown in Britain and you've sat next to Sanjib, you've sat next to Tongu, you've sat next to Derek, you've sat next to Tarquin, you know, you 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 sort of like have an idea of the way in which everybody sort of like interacts on different levels. So me being me being black British, born here, multicultural Britain, should I say, um, that's what's enabled me to sort of like cross, cross over, as they say. Oh, that is great. So we are here celebrating Black History Month. What is Black History Month? Because where I come home from, we do not have Black History Month. We do not have White History Month. And that, that kind of makes sense that you wouldn't have Black History Month because... The thing is, is that black people have been here since day dot. So why is it that we've got a month in which to celebrate everything that black people have ever done? You know, it's because, I mean, I, 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 the thing is, is that the, the way in which we all talk, we all talk in, in, in westernized language. Yeah. So we speak, we speak English. So because we speak English, the rules are made by the English or the Europeans, should I say. So it's the Europeans who have decided that, well, you know what, um, you guys have been here living in England now since 1958 during the Windrush era, and you're complaining that you don't know much about yourselves. So what we're going to do is we're going to give you a month in which you can celebrate everything you ever did. Now, I would be more respectful of them if they actually gave us a day as opposed to a month. Yeah, a day where um, black people come out with balls and chains and white people walk around going, sorry, I apologize for everything that we ever did. That I would, I, that I would, I would more celebrate that than I would a month because we've done too much to try and cram into one month what we've actually done. And what they actually did with Black History Month in the UK was they sent us 
across to us a load of things that the Americans had done. There was no history about what took place in the UK because I'm from the UK. So we heard about like the Rosa Parks. Rosa Parks sat on a bus and because she sat on a bus, right, now all black people can sit on a bus. But what they don't tell you is that in Bristol, we had a bus boycott before Rosa Parks. There's no, there's no record of that history whatsoever. You know, so so the achievements that we've been that we've made over here has been put to the to the one side. We grew up knowing more about what was going on in the Atlantic than we did about what was going on here in the UK. We had more of an idea of what perception we were given of what Africa looked like than we actually did about where we actually came from. So, I mean, I learned about the Caribbean initially through what my mum and dad told told me, and through what I saw on TV. Mm. Yeah, that that is uh that is so interesting. And uh, what do you do? Do you celebrate? And if you do, what do you do to celebrate Black History Month? Well, what tends to happen, as especially as a as a, as a comedian, is that a lot of the Black organisations tend to um, ask us to come out and um, perform. Yeah. So that is, that's a regular, that's something that happens like, like time, you know, like the calendar months changes from one, one month and then it moves into 12. That's something that we do. Um, what I try to do um, during Black History Month is to get as much finance out of the government as possible to put on shows after Black History Month. <laughs> because... <laughs> They they start offering us um, they start they start they start offering us grant money um, that we can use. Um, they, I mean it's it's I mean it's it's their way of trying really. It's their way of of try, of trying to appease and of, of trying to show that they're trying to um, integrate us into into mm. this society. And and I, and I and I do appreciate that. I know what I said was a bit tongue in cheek, yeah. Uh, but I do appreciate what they're trying to do. But my thing is is now is that I have three daughters and I have um, two grandchildren. So my main concern when it comes to Black History Month is what kind of legacy, what what am I leaving in place mm. for them, so as that they can see some sort of growth. Um, and so I always try to be the example myself within my own household. Um, so one, I don't work for anybody else. Right. I work I work with people who are willing to employ me for the services that I do. Right. I work I work with people who are willing to employ me for the services that I do. So that en enables them to turn around and look at me and say to themselves, you know what? Maybe I could maybe I'm capable. Maybe I can go out and achieve. Maybe I can I mean, I saw my dad did it. You know what I mean? So it's it's like there's no reason why I can't do it. Um, but what I'm learning is that society has such a strong hold on our children. They have such a strong hold on our children that your children will even turn against you when they come home based on the things that they are taught at school, you know? Um, so then it becomes a case of, it's not just about my children. It's, a, it's about my children's friends, friends, you know, it's about the, um, the, the acquaintances that I have on the comedy circuit. Um, I'm very conscious about the things that I talk about on stage. Yeah. Um, and I made, I, I literally made a choice. I made a decision. Um, and that was that wherever I saw injustice or whether I could make a change, that's what I want my comedy to be about. Um, you do that very well. Thank you. It's not, it's not sexy. I'm aware of that. You know, it's 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 not commercial. I'm very much aware of that as well. Um, but what I've learned and what I've found is that the deeper into England I go and the more I talk to the middle classes is the more open they are to hearing another point of view. Um, I, I find that in the um, the broadcasting industry, we have what they call gatekeepers. Um, and the gatekeepers are the people who decide who's going to be on TV and who's not going to be on TV. Yep. So 
those are the people who 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 perceive me or used to should i say used to used to see me as a threat in terms of what Rudy Liquid's going to come you know we can't control his mouth we know we don't yeah. know what he's going to say so so to so to speak and it doesn't play the game no 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 he doesn't he's not one he's he's not like that he he he, he won't bend he won't bow um and it, and it, it, it's just that i just had to be, i had to be true to myself once i became true to myself it was, it was almost like i kind of like found my voice as a comedian because before i start i started out in comedy um by accident i actually started out as an eddie murphy lookalike yeah <laughs> I actually, I actually started out as a um, Eddie Murphy lookalike. I was working in a place called uh, um, the Waverley Hotel, which is in Southampton Row, which is off Marleybone High Road. And a lot of the people who was working in the hotel industry were actors, at work actors. And it was them who told me that I had this resemblance. Um, and it just, this, this is unbelievable, you know, Fenway, because... It just so happens that the day that they told me over that weekend, I went to my godbrother's house and he had a recording of Delirious, which was Eddie Murphy, which was oh. Eddie Murphy. Yeah. Eddie, the Eddie red Murphy. Uh, leather suit. The, yeah, the That's red leather right, suit. The orange leather suit. Yeah. And that was the first time I ever saw Eddie Murphy as a, as a stand-up comedian because he had, I think he had trading places out at the time. Yeah. Mm. And um, that was the first time I laughed for an hour nonstop. Because what I grew up on when it came to comedy was we had the first black uh, comedian was a guy by the name of Charlie Williams. Mm -hmm. And he used to appear during the, the, during the early 70s on a program called The Comedians. And what The Comedians would do is they would get up and tell you a joke. They would tell you a joke. And you would go, ha, 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 very funny. Mm -hmm. Yeah? And then you wait for the next joke. And they go, ha, 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 very funny. And you wait for the next joke. Um, but what Eddie Murphy taught us was like, no, a comedian is a personality. He's not a bunch of jokes. And, and he can tell a story. And because he can tell a story, you can get continuous laughter. Not just, ah, oh, I found that funny. Oh, I didn't find that one funny. Ah, oh, I found that funny. Oh, I didn't find that one funny. They kind of buy into your whole persona, who you are, what you are, what you're about. And, um, it was, it was by going, um, yeah. It was by, it was by going on the, um, by, te by, by being at the Waverly Hotel. They took a photograph, they sent it to a lookalike agency, and then the next thing I knew, I was promoting Beverly Hills Cops two, Beverly Hills Cops one, the first one, and that took me all around Europe because I used to have to go to, because at that time we had VHS recordings. Um, nowadays we don't VHS, we stream, yeah. But we had VHS recordings. I, I used to have to go around to all the shops and promote the film. Were you promoting it as Eddie Murphy? As they dressed me up as Eddie Murphy. I had women. I had the chauffeur. I lived the five. I, I lived. I lived the high life. I mean, I, I mean, I lived the high life as Eddie Murphy. It was, it was embarrassing, man, because you don't. It's horrible when you go to a, a five star hotel and then you've got to come back to an office block. Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. A tower block. Yeah. And it smells of urine. Do you know what I mean? And you're like, you, 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 you get brought back down to life very, very quickly. Very, very quickly. Comedy does that to us all the time. When you're flying business class, when you leave the airport, it's like, I'm back to reality. I have to carry my own suitcases. Yes. I mean, I, sometimes my wife used to have to put me in place because I used to go, why are these towels not clean? What's going on here? <laughs> <laughs> Please do share some footage of uh, when you were when you were Eddie Murphy. The pictures that I've got are starting to degrade, unfortunately, which is a bit which is a bit sad. Yeah, it wasn't as easy to to capture moments as it is now. It's a bit sad. We had Kodak cameras back then. There are probably people out there, Rudy, who are telling people I took a, a photo with Eddie Murphy. There were people who who actually said that, and. Um, I think that that is what introduced me to the world of that introduced me to the world of stand up. Um, it's not what made me want to become a stand up, but it introduced me to it um, because 
after that, I kind of like discovered Richard Pryor. I was aware of him, but not, I wasn't a student of comedy at that point in time. And when did you start? I, I start, I would say that I started around the mid eighties um, as, as a lookalike. I didn't really get into the comedy until not about 92. It wasn't until about 1992. And that, and that's when I entered a competition um, that was run by a, a program called um, Choice FM, a radio station called Choice FM. And um, I came second in that. And that was as the Eddie Murphy lookalike. I came second. Yeah, um, that, was a, that was a wonderful feeling. That was a wonderful feeling. But at, at that time, I kind of like knew that I was wearing another character and that it wasn't really me. You could say in hindsight, I should have played the character a little bit more. Um, but I chose, I kind of like chose not to. Hold on, let me see if I can find something for you. Oh, my, that's him. That's not you. Yeah. That's Eddie Murphy. That's not you. Yeah, you can just, uh, just about see it coming through. Yeah. That, oh, my. Yeah. So that's how I literally got into the, into it. And then when I, when I came second in that competition, that kind of like told me something else. And then what happened after that was that there was a program called the 291 Club, which was one of the very first uh, black TV shows on, um, on, on, a, on a terrestrial channel. But at that time, I had a character by the name. I wanted to do a character by the name of Nati Bungo, who was a rust. He was a rasta man, yeah, and he was very pro-black because around this time I started doing it. I start because it's it's funny that that when you get older, as you start to get older, you start reading more and you start wanting to find out more about yourself and what you're about. I came across Marcus Garvey, and Marcus Garvey was the person who influenced me. To the point where it was a case of he would say get up you mighty race sort of like thing and he was the one who inspired me to become self-made because he said that it was possible yeah. and he was the one who began to get me to look at society through my own lens and not the lens of what i was taught in school because in 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 school you get brainwashed you don't start to educate yourself until you leave school that's when that's when your education really begins so at that time in 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 the uk we were going through high unemployment i used to go to the job center and i would see like a set of doors in front of me and it would say skilled or unskilled so i went through the skilled door i saw another set of two doors it said male or female so i went through the male door and then i saw a final set of two doors and it said labor or conservative and i went through the conservative door and i found myself back out on the street again right <laughs> so when I decided that I was going to do the 291 Club and I wanted to do it as this Rasta character, during my audition, that was the joke that I told. Yeah. And the producer came running up, running up, running down the aisle. And he said to me, I think that if you do that Rasta character, yeah, you're going to alienate yourself and you're more than likely going to upset the little old lady who lives in Bournemouth. Yeah. And what I suggest that you do is you take off those locks, you take off those glasses, you take away that big spliff that you was carrying on because it's a big character of a character that I was doing. Right. And you change what you were going to, you were going to talk about because basically I was challenging the status quo. And he, at the time I wasn't aware of what I was doing. All I knew is that this is what I wanted to talk about. Yeah. So I did all of that. I, I, I did as I was told because I didn't know that as, as a character, by de-dressing myself, I'd lost the character. I had no concept of that. Now, the, the, two, the 291 was based off a show known as um, The Apollo, Saturday Night at The Apollo, mm -hmm. where audiences were encouraged to disrespect or boo acts that they didn't like. Mm. So I was introduced onto the stage as um, Rudy Liquid, uh, this Rasta character. And when I walked onto the stage, I looked nothing like the character that I was supposed to be. Yeah. And it only took a matter of seconds before the boos started coming. And um, I got booed off the stage that night. But what that led to is it led to me going into depression. Oh, I'm so the sorry. No, it's cool. 
the reason why I, I ended up going into depression was that well, I was coming from a background of somebody who was quite successful in everything that he'd done. Yeah. Um, you know, for me as a child growing up, I was like the captain of the football team. I was the captain of the cricket team. I was in the chess championships. You know what I mean? Um, and all of a sudden I'm being told I'm not good at something. Mm. For the first time. But but not only am I not being told that I'm not good at something, but I'm being told I'm not good at something by my own people. The same people who I felt at my at that point in time that I was trying to represent when I was on stage. But they were laughing at the character that was now created by the producer. Yes. yes. Yeah, unfortunately. They were not laughing at you. Yeah. It was it was it, it was a tough time because that program programmed audiences to see me on stage. And the first thing that they would do is they go, isn't that the guy who was on the 291? And they go, yeah, 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 it's him. We're supposed to boo him now. And they would, they would start to boo mercilessly, mercilessly. Um, and this was, the whole circuit witnessed this um, as, it was, as, it was, as it was happening to me. Um, and it took about, it took about, maybe six, seven years for me to show them that um, you lot are wrong because the comedy that we were doing in Britain at the time was very much based around being Jamaican. No, very much the comedy of making fun of being Jamaican because I noticed when I first came here that Africans who did comedy that I got to see would be making fun of being African would be That's making right. fun of their mother's accent, would be making That's fun, right. of, but you're not representing your own people. No, no. I, I was shocked when I first came and saw that in the- I'm not surprised, the, I'm not African surprised. Comedy. I'm not surprised because it was, it was almost like the comedy, it was like we had, we, it's like we had, we had to ridicule ourselves in order to find the funny, um, which I was kind of like very much against. One, because I was Guyanese, not Jamaican. So, and, you know, Guyana is part of a continent. It's not, it is part of the Caribbean simply because the British went in there, the Spanish went in there and the Portuguese went in there. But in actual fact, it's part of South America, which is a, which is a continent all by itself. So it meant that I had a different outlook, not deliberately putting myself in that position, but it just, I, I looked at the world from a different, from, through a different lens. And so then I started to chastise the Jamaicans for, um, you know, being who they were and what they were about. Um, and then I kind of began to feel that I'm, even though I'm doing that, I'm actually creating more of a division. I'm not really bringing us together as such, you know. And then so what, what we decided to do was I decided with a guy by the name of Keith Palmer to create our own comedy school. And the whole point of the comedy school was to address this balance, this, this try and turn it round um, and try to get the, 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 the circuit to start thinking and looking at comedy through the lens of being black British. Even though I still struggle with that word black because we're not, we're Africans, yeah? But it was trying to broaden it and be more inclusive about what, we, what we're about and what we're, what we're prepared to laugh at, so to speak, or what we're prepared to call humour. Um, and the good thing is, is that out of the school, uh, the comedy school, we've now had three people who have entered Britain's Got Talent, either got to the final or won it. You know? So the, the, the comedy school has now become a ladder. Uh, it's been a way in which uh, students can now make their way through the through the comedy circuit. There is a place to go. Because I, as I became a student of comedy, I, I went to a place called Jackson's Lane to try to understand what are the techniques that are required in order to put together a comedy routine. What is a comedy school? Because for me, where I come from, we don't have any comedy school. And we're always thinking, why do people go to school for comedy? Nobody can teach you to be funny. You either have it or you don't. So what do people learn in a comedy school? Straight away, I understand when people say that. 
um, you can't teach anybody to be funny. I mean, innately, that's within you. But then you've got to look at it this way. You've got Usain Bolt. Nobody can't teach Usain Bolt how to run. But they can show him that if he, if he, if he, if he adjusts what he's doing, he can run faster. Everybody needs a coach. No matter who you are. A boxer, a writer, whatever. Everybody, everybody has a coach. So you've got people who've got years of experience in terms of doing things, and therefore they can show you or explain to you how you can do things a little bit better. As a comedian, you can start to, to explain to people the, the techniques that are used when it comes to comedy. You can start to explain why people are laughing for the reasons that they're laughing. So if we start by talking about what is a comparison, a comparison is whereby I compare one thing with another. So I can talk about what it is to youngsters about them not being young and them not having mobile phones, yeah? But as a child growing up, we didn't have mobile phones. We just had two Heinz baked beans tins with a piece of string running through it, right? So now there's the humour because yeah. of what? That's, and that's just a straight comparison. That, mm. That's all that is. But the thing is, is that you've got people who talk like this, but they don't know they're talking like that. So you've explained that to them now. So now when you, when you decide that, oh, I'm going to do, I'm going to do a comedy routine and you go, what are you going to do a comedy routine about? Oh, I don't know. Well, what are you interested in? You find out what they're interested in and then they, and they'll start talking to you and, you and you'll be able to say, explain to them, you know, you can compare that with this. You know, you start to explain to them what is the list of threes. And the list of threes is like when you mention, you talk about, you talk about something and you can say, she had nice ears, she had long hair, and she had a penis. Right? <laughs> so that's the threes. Do you get what I mean? The third thing is always the thing that's out of place. Mm. Yeah. So the comedy school teaches you the various techniques that are used. Uh, throughout a comedy routine so as that you're you're not you're not going up on stage in the hope of making people laugh you understand why they're laughing you created that situation now you're making me want to go to a comedy school you don't need to go to a comedy school because the thing is is that you've worked out your you've worked out your formula already and it's it's inherent it is it's it's innate within you and you understand your culture. So you know that you've got certain sayings. You know what I mean? Like we would say, small axe, lick down big tree. You understand? And for us culturally, if you can talk using sayings, that, becomes, that in itself becomes a routine of sorts. You know? So it's, it's understanding your culture. It's, 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 it's understanding the people that you're talking to. Yeah? And their, and their sensibilities. And also understanding how to monetize it is very important because uh, having talent and not knowing what to do with it, how to get into professional spaces, how to behave professionally on and off stage, I think those are very important things as well for us to learn. Because some people, I've seen people improve massively just by their mannerism or just by how they dress. It, 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 it can totally change a performer. Because sometimes we understand the show, we don't understand the business. But you, you just now, I think you just now said it, it's called show business. There's the show and then there's the business. I mean, 90%, it, almost 80%, 90% of the work is actually done off stage, which is the, the networking, do you get me? It's, the, it's, it's your demeanor, your behavior, your attitude, you know? Because I know, I know of great comics who are out there right now, but they, they can't get their foot through the front door simply because of the attitude that comes with them. They're diff either they're diff either they're seen as being difficult to work with, yeah, or they disrupt the um they disrupt the green room for whatever reason, you know. Um, and when you try when you try to 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 tell them this, they don't want to know. So sometimes it's best just to shut up. Keep your mouth closed. I learned very quickly when I first started comedy in the UK was you guys are very time sensitive. Yeah. You do not deal with African time. 
No. In Africa, when we say the show is starting at six, the show might start at two a.m. the next day. <laughs> yeah. In Africa, when we say an open mic has ten minutes, as long as people are laughing, they can be there for forty-five minutes. Nobody. Okay. Okay. But you know, when they say ten minutes, you do eleven minutes. It's like you've disturbed the whole thing. Yeah, because time is money. Yeah, because time is money. Time is money over here. It's like if you if you book a space, be it a theater, uh, be it a, a theater, be it a club or whatever you, it opens at a certain time and it closes at a certain time. And within that time, there's all these other people that has has to be paid. So when you start running over time, yeah, when you start running over time, that's overtime. And who's going to pay that? Pay it that. Pay a month. <laughs> Well, if you come to work at uh, five in the morning, if you still need to be there until 12 a.m., you stay there. You're getting paid per month. But yeah, because people get paid per hour. That's right. That's <laughs> right. That's right. They get, yeah, I never thought about that. I never thought about. Yeah, I've always felt that um, the reason why we disrespect time is because it's not our time. Uh, <laughs> it's time. It's time that's been put upon us. Yeah, True. I mean, we knew about time a very long time ago. Um, we if we go back as far as the Dogans. The Dogans knew about time from time. Do you know what I mean? They 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 understood that they understood the way in which the the the, the sun would move. Yeah. Yes. And through the you sun know. moving, that is how they measure time. Yeah. Uh, it's it's the Europeans who came in and systemized it, mm. and then they've got everybody's by everybody's. Everybody's clock is not is not actually working the way that it should be because we're trying to fit everything into what is known as nine till five. We're all trying to behave in this way. Nine till five, this is when you go to work, you get home, you go to sleep, you get up, you go back to work, according to the times that they have set, because it's all based around industry. My grandfather used to say that you should never be on time because people who ended up in America on those boats are the ones who made it on time. They were okay. caught. So don't be on time because you don't know who, who else is waiting for you on the other side. So No, that's true. I mean, that's true. I so when you are late, it's to confuse the enemy. I asked our people who watch the show to send some questions that they would like to find out about you. Who is your favorite historical black figure well he's, he's he's he should be known but he's not really known he goes by the name of um lewis latimer mm -hmm. um lewis latimer used to work for a gentleman by the name of thomas edison yeah and thomas edison was a guy a, a white guy in america and what he did was he used to patent um inventions and what Lewis Latimer did was he he he, he adapted the, the the filament in a light bulb so that it would burn brightly, yeah. Because um, everyone everybody assumes that Edison was the one who found electricity and all that kind of stuff, which ain't true, right? It ain't true, yeah. And um, it was coming across this guy, and I said, well, when you think about what he's done by just coming up with the invention of the filament for the light bulb, we can all see at night around the world. Around the world. That, and that's him. He, that is my favorite historical figure, you know? Um, and there, there's, there's, there's so, there's, there's, I mean, there's so much more to him because I mean, he, he also patented it. So he, that means that, he, that he's getting rights that's coming to him. And it's coming to his family because I've always said that um, the Europeans never really invented anything because they never had to work. Right. They patented it. So that's that's what they invented. They invented the word patent. That's what they invented. Nothing else, because even the door handle, the door, the, the brush, the, the, the things to cut hedges. Right. It was the Africans who had to invent all of these things to make work easier for themselves. And then because they were owned by their slave masters, whatever they invented became the slave masters. And then the slave masters would patent anything and everything that was invented 
by the slave. So by coming across people like um, Lewis Latimer and learning that he patented what he did, right? Um, was ten and this is like in the mid 18th century, was telling me that as, as, as a people, as a race, we were advanced. As a people, as a race, we were moving forward. And there were, there were a few who were, who were making waves. You know, it's like you've got, you've got, you've got Charles Darwin. He's, a, he's another classic example. Charles Darwin is meant, meant to be like the godfather of biology. Yeah. But nobody talks about John Edmondston, Edmund Stone. Now, John Edmund Stone was the guy who taught Charles Darwin about taxidermy. And that enabled him to then go around the world, see animals, stuff them. He, 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 in, in, in fact, John Edmondson lived in um, Scotland. The guy lived in Scotland. And I'm gonna yeah, I'm going to tell you something else. He lived on um, 37 Lithuanian Street. You even know the address? Yes. The reason why I know the address is because when I did my first Edinburgh show, right, and I was doing my studies and what have you uh, in my own way. I was educating myself, so to speak. Where I did my first show was on the same road that he lived. And yeah. I went to his house, 37 Lithuanian Street. There's a plaque there, right? Um, he, he also worked in their university, in the, in the museum. If you talk to any... Scottish Scottishman who lives around there, ask them about John Edmiston. They will tell you. They don't mind sharing that kind of information. They don't mind sharing that kind of knowledge. Um, it's only it's when you come to the English that's when it starts to change. Yeah. Wait, wait, next time I go to Edinburgh, I'm actually going to go to find the house. It's 37, 37 Lithuanian Street. He lived there. He taught Charles Darwin. He was the one who taught, taught him about the leaves and the plants. Um, how to preserve the specimens. Um, John Edmondson did all of that, but John Edmondson is not in the records. He's not there. You won't find him. You know? Yeah, they, they, there's so much. Even now, there's a big this debate where they're now realising that there's some ma smartness behind mad houses. Well, that's that's the other thing. I think, you know, if... if, if if, if, if the question ever be asked about what was one of the lies that I was told about Africa, was that everybody came from... No, 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 I've got that question. It's coming. It's coming. Please, please hold. Please hold. Yeah, someone actually did send that question. Oh, yeah, someone did. Uh, okay, let's go. Let's go to the next question. Are I schools think... doing enough to teach about black history? The, the obvious answer to, the, to that one is no, right? No. Um... And, I, and, and on one level, I kind of understand why. Because if they were to teach it, everything collapses. The, tr when the truth, When the truth comes out, everything collapses. You know, when, you, when we were sitting down um, learning about the, um, the Pythagoras theory, and we were told that it was the, the Greeks who invented it, but they don't tell us that the Greeks went over to Egypt and they were taught it. They don't tell us that the Pythagoras theory was 2,600 years, was used 2,600 years before Pythagoras was born. They don't, they don't tell us this, this kind of information. And that's what I liked about the comedy, was the comedy allowed me to open my mouth. <laughs> it allowed me to open my mouth and start telling these people this, you know what I mean? That you know, what I mean that, that that you lot you lot were the ones who came from the, the 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 brickwork. You were the ones who came out of the caves. Do you get me? We had all of this already. We knew all of this. It's just that for four hundred years you've brainwashed us by not allowing us to read and what have you to know about this. You know, you you taught us about Christianity, but you never taught us about Horus. You never taught us about Osiris. You never told us. That really and truly, you got the story out of the the, the tombs in Egypt. How you know that uh, Christianity is questionable is that growing up in South Africa, the Bible was translated into all languages, but not one mathematic book was translated into our languages. 
Not one biology book was translated into our languages, only the Bible. So that's what they really want you to know. Other things, there's no accounting book that is translated into an, an African language. So why are they translating the Bible? Why, 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 what's so special that they really want to make sure that we, we learn this book? I found that I learned that it was because they they had to attack our spirituality. They had mm. to, they had they they once they became God in our eyes, then that's when they became superior. Uh, and I think n n not even the real Christians believe in Christianity in truth. They know that it's fictitious. They know mm. that it was made up. They know it's it's a bunch of stories and parables that were put together. Yeah, there are morals that can be learned from it. Don't get me wrong, people. Mm. Please don't misunderstand me. But it was constructed with the view that it would control, because um, when Rome was when Rome was falling, they asked themselves, "How are they going to keep things together? What are they going to do in order to um, control the masses?" And that's when they decided that they would then take control of Christianity. Um, there's a there's a lot there's a lot there's a lot that people could learn themselves actually through just going and, and starting to read about it. Um, the person that they want to go and, and look at is by the name of um, Constantine. Because it was Constantine uh, who was the one who, who made that decision that, that all Romans would now um, worship Christianity with the view that it would stop the soldiers from, from not fighting from not protecting rome and the thing is is that as the spiritual people especially when you're um enslaved we took we took that on very quickly we embraced it actually um to our own detriment because now it could be now it can and has been used against us um it's caused division and that that was the whole point of it really was to cause division um because otherwise to that we were a, we were a very strong people a very um strong race of people the only thing that we didn't understand was we we couldn't comprehend the type of violence that our european cousins could bring we had no concept of that kind of violence that kind of terror that mentality um but when you're coming from a place of scarcity which is what our western cousins were coming from you know what i mean because when you look at in the you're living in the uk now yeah and all we can do is grow apples and shrubs, yeah, berries, maybe the odd berry or two. But you're not seeing no livestock. You're not seeing lush. You know what I mean? Greenery. You're not. And it's such a shame that when you think of violent people, they've made it so that you think of black people. Yeah, it's, it's history they've, they've, they've... tells us who's most violent. History tells us who's been invading. History yes. tells us who's been going to other people's countries with guns. Yes. Yes. And that's why it's, it's wonderful to see what's happening today. The way in which um, Africa seems to have woken up to all of this. Booker Barama's yes. woken up. But it's, it's, it's the corruption that will keep us in the dark. Because when you see countries where they like, there's famine, there's no, no food, people can't even eat, but they have guns. Who's bringing the guns and bullets? There's no <laughs> Food that's it and of bread but you can afford to buy bullets yeah, that's it and it's, it's, it's like where are those bullets coming from because the thing is is that the, the the africans they knew about fire they knew about explosions but they chose not to it was even the chinese knew about it yeah mm -hmm. we all knew every all of the races knew about it but the only people who decided they was going to take it and that is that is how they that that's basically how they conquered the world but they can't they can't continue in that mode anymore simply because we've got the internet believe it or not the internet gives everybody everybody can see everything all at the same time we can all see it one thing i love the most about uh the internet it has shown people the real africa but let's not let's not dwell on that because that question is coming one thing you wish you were taught in school i wish that i was taught the truth that i mean which is basically what we were saying, I wish I was, I wish I was taught, taught the truth. I wish I was taught real history. I know about 1066. 1066 was the Battle of Hastings. Do you see how that just rolled off my tongue? Because that's what I was taught at school. I don't, I, you know, I had to find out about um, 
to say all the virtue. And um, what's it? Was it 18? It was about 1883 where he fought Napoleon. Yeah. N N Haiti was the one place that Napoleon couldn't take. That's why that's why Haiti is as poor as it is today. And the Europeans have never have never allowed Haiti to forget that. I wish I wish I was taught the truth. I wish I was taught the truth about which doctors. That they understood medicine. You know, that they, they, they knew what, what plant to pick up from what plant not to pick up. And they work with nature rather than all these poisons that we have been given. They don't, they don't work with they don't work with poison at all because the only reason why the pharmaceutical industry is in the position that they're in is because they can't patent nature. Mm. But they can patent synthetic synthetic drugs is what they patent and call their own and give it a name. They create the problem and then try and, and then sell you the solution. Do you know, you know in South Africa it was illegal to be a traditional healer? That's why they, they called it. Who? That's Ooh. why they made it. That's why they called it witchcraft to yeah. make it seem like you. You're they demonize it. Healing, you're witching. Yeah, they demonize it. They demonize yeah. all of those things. You know. So when we saw when we saw the dancing and everything, it was they were that's that that was their way of demonizing it. So is that it? It looks weird. It, it, it is weird to me. I'm I'm British. It is weird to me because you know, growing up seeing what I saw. And then all of a sudden to see these people, and not only that, they're not wearing clothes and what have you. And you think, what the hell is going on? Forgetting that the temperature is totally different in Africa to what it is in the UK. Hence why we have to dress up and cover ourselves all the, all, all the time, you know? And then they're saying, oh, that's barbaric, that's this, that, and that. But if you want to talk about depraved, if you want, let's talk about, they, 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 they attribute things like cannibalism to, to the Africans, but in actual fact, it's actually the Europeans. They're talking about themselves. They're actually talking about themselves. They're not actually talking about our people, but they, they throw it all on us. And then you see, the I, here's where I give our European friends their juice, yeah? Here's the one thing that they did that's got them into this position. Everybody speaks English. Everybody reads English. He who controls the language controls the narrative. Yep. I will, that's what they say in Africa. We have a saying... Uh, if you wanna tell, if if you wanna kill an African story, tell it in English. Okay, there you go. And you go. when you come to South Africa, I will take you to a witch doctor. You will. <laughs> but we don't call them witch doctors anymore. We call them healers. I'll take you. I'll take you to Thank a healer. You, you can yeah, decide. Would... Hey, but some of them, they can bring back lost lovers. They can make you win the lottery, even though themselves they haven't won it. They can. Uh, get you married even though they are not married they can they they will even sell you money like you give me a hundred thousand rands i'll give you four million it's like and then you can buy lightning if you don't like someone and you want to send lightning to their house you can right. buy it and they can do it for you but they're in touch see they're in touch with nature in a way that we just don't see what, what the, the beauty of once you're still once you're living in africa you're connected to your history. Mm -hmm. I've had to go around grabbing history. I've had to go around trying to claim it. You know, um, once I started learning about the Moors, there's a classic example of me learning about the Moors and um, what they did for Europe before um, 1492. Yeah, where they bought mathematics, they bought chemistry, they bought agriculture, they bought all of these things. Um, and not only that, but because they were called Moors, it meant all of that history was associated with them. Yeah. When I talk, when I talk, oh, where are you from? Where, who are you? Oh, I'm British. Oh, you are. So what have you done as black British? Oh, you came over in 1958. That's all that's associated with me. The Windrush generation, 1958, they arrived. Yeah. When they arrived, this is what they looked like. This is what they did. Yeah. And that's all that they did. Yeah. And then, our, and then black British history begins. Right. So in order for me to make my fell self feel whole, <clears throat> what I used to have to do was when I used to fill out application forms and they would ask, what is your ethnicity? I would put more. I'm a more. So now when you look at me, you're not looking at a black man anymore. You're looking at somebody who's got history. You're looking at somebody who took Europe out of the dark because the dark ages was when 
the the Moors were in control of the whole of Europe. That's why they called it the Dark Ages. I didn't know that's why they called it the Dark Ages. They never told us that's the reason why they called it the Dark Ages. They never told us that's the reason why they called it the Dark Ages. You're, you're probably the reason now they give us a choice to tick from because they're like, uh-uh, they're going too wild. They're putting, because uh, yeah. now they, they, they tell you, Black, I never feel it because they, it's always given as an option. But I know if you don't fill it up, if you don't fill in that part, they know you're black. Because yeah, no, they, they assume that. You're, yeah, the, the thing is, they yeah, they, they they will say that you're black. But once once they say that you're black, what they're saying to you is that you're a slave. Yeah, and and and, and we're not because the word slave is is Slavic for um for Slovakia. For those were the slaves. They were Europeans. We mm. weren't slaves. We've never been. We've never really been slaves. We've. I mean, we were. We were just. We were just taken. We were. We were. We're not slaves, not in that respect. We're Africans. Well, and when you when you attribute that to being African, then you take everything that Africa has to offer. You take the pyramids. You take the pyramids. You take the lighting. You take the food. You take the animals. You take. That's you. But by them getting us to identify as being Black British or Black, that limits us to our history. In England, they will say Black British. Yes. But in America, they say African American. And yes. I've always wondered why say African American, but you never say European American. Because they're, no. they're not natives to America. They never say they're European not. American. They say African American. Yeah, it, it, they... It's so strange. But here, they don't say African British. They say Black British. Yeah. They're black because that's where you stop. You stop at once you're once you're black, then that means that you're meant you're 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 indentured, you're a slave. That's 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 you and that's and your history. That's a word that's associated with everything dark and bad. And bad, yeah. Yeah, blackboard, blackboard, black, black, uh, black male. Why know. can't cars have white tires? Why must it be the black tires that carry the load? <laughs> <laughs> I love questions well, I like that. The one what? line that I was told about Africa, oh, that's an easy one. Tarzan ruled the jungle. That Tarzan was the um was the man is because the thing is is that I grew up, as I said, I grew I grew up in the UK. So it was like when I looked at when I looked at Africa, this is what I saw that this man was in charge. And mm. he would beat up like all 20 Africans all at the same time. He would fight crocodile, this man. This man would would ride he'd ride the elephant. You get me? He's in, he's in control of stuff, and through that, it, it, it started to infiltrate into the into the cartoons because then they would take the witch doctor that Tarzan would jump on, and they'd all be dancing around this cooking pot with bones in their noses, you know. So that was that was a lie, but I bought into that lie because I was a child. But television has power to control us. That's why we must take advantage of these social media platforms where we can where we, where we can do what we want to do, tell our own stories. Because even growing up, I had never seen any black British people, any Africans in Britain. I saw a few shows with black Americans, African Americans. And I, I, I have never, and even when it comes to African America, because growing up, we wanted yeah. to be the inuit because oh. that's all the music we were sent with black people calling each other that so we yeah. thought that was a cool thing that was a cool word and you go to america and you're like but why are you guys calling each other this if you don't want to be called this and what then i remember what they growing up, you realize but that's what they promote that's yeah, the music we it promote and take all it over the world money it makes money it's the money that they're running after um I mean, one of my biggest, one of my biggest current um, heroes when it comes to comedy is Chris Rock, right? Uh, because he's he's more of a satirist than he is just a joke teller. Um, but even he, I felt feel feel let down. Um, Dave Chappelle, I kind of like feel let down that they haven't really challenged that. Um, and the reason why they haven't challenged that is the money. Because when 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 an African American says, "Oh, I'm African American," what he is basically saying to himself is that by me being African American, I can have all the refinery in life that it has to offer. Yeah, not not the true value of life, but it becomes very selfish in nature. 
and that is against our nature as a, as a, as a people. I think because now I'm speaking in terms of um, what what I what I learned through reading um, and what I learned in my 60 years of living in the UK that there's more to life than money. But the values of America is based around money. And it mm. is about me showing myself off to against somebody else to say that I'm better than you because I have three cars, whereas really and truly I only need one. I have a house that has got 42 rooms, where in actual fact, you just need enough room for you and your family. With most West Indians, when they came over to the UK, was they came here with a five-year plan. And then the five-year plan was to, was, to most, was supposed to enable them to build a house back home. They used to all just want to build a house back home. And the, the house back home would have about 13 rooms in it. Because the 13 rooms were, were there to house family and friends and the children that they brought into the world while they were here. What they didn't anticipate was that they were going to get caught up in the trap of having a mortgage a mortgage that they would have to pay off for 30 years. And not only that, but the fact that they were going to end up having children. And from the time you have children, that's another expense that you never anticipated that he was going to have. Yeah. And also that when you come here, you're going to be watching TV shows that keep reminding you that things are not going well at home. That's right. If you that's want to right. that you, 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 it makes you believe that your children have better education if they are here. If they're here. Your that's children it. speak better English if they are here. Your children well, have more. Yeah, you're right. Well, the, the, fact the, the fact of the matter is, you do speak better English if you're here, because yes. it's, you do, because it's this is where it come from. Yeah. But the problem is, it's not a measure of intelligence. No, you, I, end that's, that's why I have streets, to you end up sweeping the street with your good English, yes. and someone who comes from a country that's considered to have a bad English accent could be a doctor. That's correct. That's correct. It's a shame that we haven't got footage of some of the the Windrush generation when they came over. Because if you look at them, as you pointed out just now, they would have had, they would have been doctors, they would have been nurses, they would have been teachers, they would have been engineers, they would have been blacksmiths, they would have been farmers, they would have been physicians, they would have been all of these people. And then you see them working in their really nice clothes on a building site, ill-equipped. It still happens with Africans where people will leave their professions in Africa. And also something that uh, people don't explain here is that the cost of living is equal to the money you get paid. Because when you think, oh, I'm just going to be doing this job and earning 3,000 pounds a month, you're thinking 60,000 rands, which is, okay. it, it's what it is in South Africa. But okay. for 60,000 rands in South Africa, you're living a luxurious life. Okay. For what you pay here for a two-bedroom apartment, you could have a mansion where I come from. Okay. But then, but, but all of that is that is also manufactured by the intermonetary system. So That's why that, when they retire, they go to Africa. A lot of British people, when they retire, you sell your two bedroom house for three hundred thousand pounds. You have, ooh, you have about seven million rands. You whoa. can live like a king. You buy a nice mansion. You can have a maid, a full time living maid, and a driver for the rest of your life. Whoa. I'm, and I'm, you'll I'm, be able to I'm, go out and eat in good restaurants every I'm, day. For, I'm, for I'm, leaving, I'm, in, I'm leaving England tomorrow. I'm leaving. I'm leaving. I'm going. <laughs> go. Still at my house and go. The comedy yeah. scene is very good in South Africa as well. Still at my house and go. But it's the fear, you know. It's the fear of, of, of not knowing. Because I've, I've asked myself that question so many times. Why am I here? The reason why I'm here is because of my grandchildren and my children. And I've always... What we just now said it, it's the education, and we're hoping that that education is going to have enabled them to have a better life. So I can't just leave them. But I know of people who have gone to Africa and like built like bloody housing estates and stuff like that. Um, and I don't think I have that kind of courage. Um, I don't have that in me. I, re I really wish I did have it in me. I, th I think it's more in ladies, it's more in women. Women have, uh, have that ability to get up and leave to make life elsewhere. Men tend to stay still um, and build around them because this is what I know. Men don't even make life in the literal way. Yeah, you have to give it to a woman. Like we create life, we make life. So it's easy for us. Yeah. 
yeah 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 i mean we're, we are we are scaredy cats um and i can't say that we're not my most inspirational um black person i would have to say let me think most inspirational first of all i would have said marcus garvey yeah because mm -hmm. he inspired me to 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 think and to to believe to start to believe in myself he was the one who did that to me yeah then it, then the next person has to be dick gregory yeah mm. yeah it has to it has to be because marcus was the one who put the politics in me he put he put globalization into me he put look at africa ends into me but it was um this man dick gregory who changed my life completely mm. he was the one who, who taught me that you can take your um, oppression and you can make it humorous and not only can you make it humorous to your own people but you can do so with uh european people he was yeah. the first person i saw who do who do who did that and that was where my motivation came from and that's where my comedy began it stopped being a superficial thing of me just saying oh i'm just getting up on the stage and making people laugh i stopped doing that and i started saying no nah, i want you to laugh but i also want you to think and i and and and, and through you thinking i want it to create change i want there to be change making the world a better place one joke at a time yeah hey i should write that down <laughs> You were born here in in the UK. You were born in Britain, born and bred in London. Yes, I was born. In, I was born in um, Kensington. Have you ever been? Oh, uh, no. Um, you've been to Africa, I know, because we recently went to Morocco. Yeah, I've always, I've always, always the northern end. Always the northern end. Yeah. Always on the coast. Always on the coast. I haven't gone in. I haven't gone into the interior or you know the dominican republic i haven't been uh, i would love to i'd love to go to uganda i'd love to go to mozambique i really i really would um but most of my traveling that i've ever done is, is i've always been invited i've always been invited um it, but i know that if i was to go to africa in that respect it has to be a case of me and my wife going right we are going here and then I would, and then I would get there. Whereas most of the time, I saw the, the way that I got to see the world was through my work. Comedy was, and comedy, yeah, that comedy did that for me. Level. We are so privileged. So I want to see if uh, there are any similarities between people who grow up here, and I, I don't feel comfortable saying black people, but that's what uh, they are called in the UK. It's Black History Month, so we will have to work with the word. Black people who live in the UK and black people who live in Africa, because I grew up in Africa. And I'm going to ask you a few questions and let me know if you relate. You're not actually related to most of your cousins. You're not actually related. Nah, you are related. We are related. You know, I mean, you know, you know what that means? Like no. how your, your mother's friends, children will be cousins. Yeah, people you know from church are like, oh, he's my cousin. They don't have to be blood relatives for you to introduce them to people as cousins. No, I hear that. <laughs> uh, that, uh, that is, 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 is that unity in, in just unity through DNA, really, um, and, 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 and respect, because that is something that we lose in this country. Um, and the reason why we lose it is because the the way in which the Africans taught one another, it was by age groups. Age would teach age. Age would teach. So a young kid would never ever, ever should never ever end up in an argument with an older man because he's meant to go through the ages. So like it's like ten year olds get taught by twenty year olds. Twenty year olds get taught by thirty year olds, and that's how the respect comes. But once you come into the UK, that all changes. That's gone. That's gone. It's 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 a it's a measure of how much do I earn? What have you got? What haven't you got? Yeah. And then also, what is your cultural background? And also, what is your class? 
Yes. Class is something. A lot of classes in here. Yes. A lot of it. Yeah. So that I understand. A little kid's party turns into an adult. Of course. Of course. Because <laughs> if we never bring you, you wouldn't have the party now the first place. <laughs> so, so, you know, it's, it's, it's just as much our first, party as it is there. I, I first uh, uh, did my, my son's party. All the adults were so shocked that I was serving them food as well. That okay. I was like, I catered for them. Because here they just do, if it's a kid's party, you bring your child for two hours, they sit, they eat the hot dog, and then they go home. And, and then they go home. No, but like black that. parties are always different, though. Our parties will go on, man. Our parties will go on until late at night, innit? Our parties will go on until the next day. That's how that's how our, our parties have, have always... I mean, now, nowadays, that has changed, to be honest with you. Um, nowadays, the parties that we... Because we used to have house parties. We don't have house parties anymore. People go... People will, will rent out a place. Yeah, because I don't want you to go to the or running your foot over my uh, over my um, laminated floorboards and all that kind of stuff. And not only that, but at that time we weren't able to we weren't able to go we weren't able to rent out certain places you couldn't rent out. So it was always in the house. So you would roll up the carpet, carpet would go outside. You take everything that would go outside, and then you'd have maybe two two rooms might be for the kids, and another room would be for the adults. Yeah, or it might be one room for the adults, one room for the kids. So the kids have got their room where they got their music, and we got our room. I say we because I'm one of the elders now. I discovered that I was an elder then way when I went to one of those parties and I was shown the old people's room. And I thought I'm not going into the old people's room because I the old, room. <laughs> the old people in there are just talking about diabetes and gout. Yeah, <laughs> it's a gout, and I don't want to be reading from the Bible. I want to go into the other room. With them, lot, with, them, with them lot with good music thumping out, yeah, and then I twerk and I skin up themselves. That's the room that I want to go into. <laughs> Grandma is speaking in that cash when she visits. I had one aunt like that because the thing is, is that my both my parents, um, when they came from Guyana, neither of their parents were with them. So mm. I never grew up with my grandparents. My mom lost her mum at a very early age. The only grandparent I really got to know was my dad's dad. Um, and I met him when I went, when I was 13 years old, there was a time when my dad brought him over and that was it. So in terms, in terms of the extended family, I never, the extended family was my cousins and that, yes, but in terms of grandparents, no, but I always had a godmother who would do that. They always push that little money in your, in your hand. You get me like they're giving you drugs or something like that. Because if, if, if you turn around and tell your mom, look what auntie gave me. Oh, is this what your aunt gave us? You know, yes, I'll keep it for you. Me. Yes, I'll I will keep it for you. Yes. And then when you want it, they tell you, "Do you think you you, you where do you think food comes from?" That's, that's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. You think money grows on trees? Yes, actually, they do grow on trees because they're made out of paper, and then you get a slide box in your head because you try to be smart. You know what I mean? So yeah, um, I mean, even I did that myself, to be honest with you, with my nieces and nephews. You use your lips when you point. That is a, that, that's a classic mum thing to do. That's classic. That's classic. That's classic. You see, you see him over there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, him. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Nobody take no food off. Mm-hmm. Yeah, man. Yeah, your mum would always talk to you with, the, with their lips. Do you know what I mean? And that's before they box you, though. <laughs> that's before they box you. Last one. Mm-hmm. The couches in your house was once covered in plastic. No, not mine. No. <laughs> No, we couldn't afford the plastic. <laughs> <laughs> we couldn't afford the plastic. I'm not, I know of it. I do know of it. Because you talk, but that is that that's talking about the front room. That's the front room. Yes. That, um that nobody that we were allowed to go in only when relatives came round would you be able to go into that front room. And that's when you start seeing cutlery you never knew that you had. That's <laughs> when all the nice cutlery comes out. You get me? Yeah. Yep. yeah, yeah. All the matching plates and yeah. 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 And I'm curious to know what was happening. So this section of the show is called What Was Happening Here. Oh, oh. that was a good time, man. That was a good time. That was um out in is it Ibiza? Was it in Ibiza then? I think it was yeah, I was uh, with um carry on comedy, that's right. We was doing mm-hmm. carry on comedy that day. 
And um, that is that guy lives, just lives down the road from me, not too far from where I live. Oh. Um, and we were at a, we were we were we were at a, we was near the beachfront, and we were playing our old music. I remember that. I remember that. I remember that. That was a nice day. That was a lovely day. Lovely day. Ah, oh, that's lovely. nice. Are you going next year, you, guys? Uh, yes, whoever no, watching no. this, please go on uh, carry on comedy, comedy website. 2024. Yeah. 2024. It's it's a holiday not to be missed. It's it's a holiday of a laugh time. Uh, right, of laugh time. That's right. A holiday yeah. of a laugh time. Yeah. What was happening here? Oh, I think we were in Manchester. We did a show in Manchester. I think that special P. That is um, Richard Blackwood and Kane Brown. The guy with the hat on, that's Special P. He's, he's got mm -hmm. one match coming up pretty soon. Richard Blackwood is now a TV star, a massive mm -hmm. TV star. Um, the guy in the middle, that's Kane. Kane Brown, he's a monster on the um, comedy circuit. He's, he actually came through the comedy school as well. He came through oh, the comedy nice. school. Um, yeah, in the white, that's Kane Brown. He came through the comedy school. Um, that's me. Um, and I look, look at that, I'm the smallest of the lot, you know, I'm the eldest of the lot. That <laughs> young standing with his big arms around me, yeah, <laughs> oh my God. I remember him when he was coming out of um, university. That's Ori Styler, known as um, Ori L. Green. Um, mm -hmm. He's another person who's doing extremely well on the, the comedy circuit. So those are my comedy acquaintances and friends. Oh, that's nice. That's nice. And here. Oh, that was when Dave Chappelle came over to, he was invited over by Kojo. And we were all down in Bethnal Green. Um, down at the, what's the name of the club out there in Bethnal Green? Uh, I can't remember the name off the top of my head. I can't uh, even but, see the yellow and black uh, sign of the club, but I, I, I just can't remember what it's called. Backyard. Yeah, backyard, that's it. Backyard comedy, that's right. And um, he came down um just before going back home and he was hosting saturday night live the next day mm. great it was great it was it was really great having him there um and it was great to see some of the material that he was going to do on saturday night live as he was as he was working it in which which which, which is what we call wip which is work in progress mm. um so it was phenomenal to know that we had the best uh comedian on the planet um grace in the stage and that's thanks to kojo kojo i mean he's currently out in america now and kojo was another one who came through the school that's a picture there of dane who's clapping his hands dane baptiste yeah. um dane baptiste is another person who came through the comedy school who um has had has had his own tv show and he's and got they're all great comics yeah he's had great recognition for doing what is known as the edinburgh um festival would you do edinburgh again no, no, I don't think there's very little I think that um, Edinburgh can do for me. I think it, in the earlier stages of my career, mm. it would make it would make a lot of sense for me to do that. Um, whereas I feel that I'm at the the other end of my career, not in terms of oh my career is coming to an end, but in terms of understanding that it's more about I've created created the comedy school with Keith, which has given people a part. But now I feel that we, we need to start having our own venues, our own places where we um, come out and perform. So is that we create a circuit of some sort. And um, maybe by going up to Edinburgh, I can make contacts and possibly it could help. But I think it's, it's, it's not something that I really want to do. I'm not even, I don't enjoy as much um running up and down the motorway as mm. i used to i'm not excited by that anymore so i pick and choose when i decide i'm going to perform and where i'm going to perform so to speak edinburgh is like a it's a it's a month commitment it is but the, but that that commitment doesn't start just in that given month that commitment would start from december mm. getting ready to go to edinburgh you know, in August. And it's a big uh, financial commitment as well. It's a massive one. And and therefore, there's a lot of sharks who are out there. I mean, I had an agent that I paid uh, two and a half grand to do my PR. And I remember one night she came into my show drunk and full of cocaine. 
and her and her mate started heckling me. And I was like, what am I paying for? What am I paying for? What am I paying for? I you might know? even have an idea of who that is, but we'll talk about it. Off. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's move on. Yeah. Uh, the next section of the show is called uh, the show is supposed to be an hour, but I'm having so much fun. Sorry so if I've overrun. I hope I'm not taking too much of your time. Uh, well, the I next... took the time out for this, to be honest with you. I really did. I really oh, did because I, so I wanted to do a good job for you. Thank you. Uh, the next section of the show is called Things You Should Never Say to a Black Person. And I'm gonna give you scenarios and tell me what you should never say to. A pregnant black woman. How many patties have you eaten today? Yeah. Where's the dead man living? Because the reason why I say that is because we always party. So when you go to a black funeral, you're like, yes, yeah, so where's the party? Where the, where, where's the party? Because I like black funerals. I do. Even when they're not my own or they're people that I don't know. All I have to do is pick up and get in. If you see there's a black funeral, you know there's a party afterwards. You just know it's going to be a rave. It's a rave. Things you should never say in a relationship with a black person, especially if you are not black yourself. Can you be Tarzan and I'll be Jane? I'd hate to hear that. Or um, let's play doctors and nurses. Or slave master and slave. Uh, that kind of thing there. And I want to know about the people in your family. First of all, who came? Who was the first person in your family who decided I'm going to London? And did your parents come here together, or did they meet here? No, my parents met when they were about five. When they were five. Five. And they started dating when they were five. Five years old. Yes, man. They met back in Guyana. They met back in Guyana. They met, met, met in Guyana. My dad sent for my mother, yeah, and brought her to London, because I've always lived in London, and brought her to London. So she came over at the age of 19. No, she came over at the age of... Wait. Did they start dating at the age of five, or did they met as, like, they went to the same church, they were in the same neighbourhood? Like, I, I'm interested in this. It was, yeah, they were in the same, they were literally in the same village. They were in the same village. Um, and it, I know that she said that it was, it was kind of like decided at a very early age that at some point she would end up with my dad. It was, you know, that whole um, betrothal thing. Yeah, it was, it, was, it, it, was, it was like that. Because the thing is, is that my sister traced our heritage we traced it back to Ghana, actually. My sister found the village and everything that we're supposed to originally come from. But I know that from what my mother explained to me, um, that it, it, a decision was kind of like made. Not that she was part privy to this decision, by the way. Um, a decision was kind of like made that she would end up with my dad. Um, and she came over. She ended up with my dad, um, which is which is just the way that it was. Um, it's not something that she was really happy with, if I'm, if I'm being honest with you. Um, but it was something that she felt that she had to 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 do to, to, because that's what was expected of her. Yeah, yeah it, was, it, was, I, it, it was it was like that, because the thing is, is that my sister traced our heritage. We traced it back to Ghana, actually. My sister found the village and everything that we're supposed to originally come from. But I know mm. that from what my mother explained to me, um, that it, it, a decision was kind of like made. Not that she was part privy to this decision, by the way. Um, a decision was kind of like made that she would end up with my dad. Um, and she came over. She ended up with my dad, um, which, is, which is just the way that it was. Um, it's not something that she was really happy with, if I'm, if I'm being honest with you. Um, but it was something that she felt that she had to 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 do too, because that's what was expected of her. Mm. Wow! Well, I recently found out about uh, there is a, a village that practices money wives in Congo. I can't remember okay. what it's called in the language. Something Yambongo, but it's money wives, which means uh, you can take a loan, and instead of paying back the money, you pay with your daughter. 
Ooh. Or you by saying, well, if when my ma if my wife ever gets a girl, they'll be your wife. So you find these really young girls mm -hmm. married, like they'll be 15, married to a 73 year old because mm -hmm. you, you, you give money. And then in, in, in return, you get the girl and they look after you and you could be in your like 90s and you still have this 20 year old wife who can't say Whoa. no because your father took the money. Whoa. I hear that. I hear that because I mean that's that's a that's a that's like a culture clash because we know that's coming from days of old in terms yes. of the way because they used to have many children. Um, but the thing is, is that I think I don't know because I was never there. I, I don't mm. believe that the, the the individual would have been abused the way that they would be abused today. Um, because the thing is, and is that. Fun. In some cultures, they 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 prefer it because it's a, it's the, it's one of the ways a family can get out of poverty. Because if okay. you as a not provide for your daughter, right, and someone comes and says, "I'll give you money to build a house and I'll take her to university," but okay. she'll be okay, it's better than having her her at home and not even knowing and what not to, being able to. That's right. Yeah, I know. It was, I know. It's 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 difficult when when I think as a Westerner to understand the behaviour or the reasons why um, some of the different um, African denominations behave, but I've learnt to try to put myself in their in their shoes or in their position to to, to better understand why they behaved or no thought the way that they did. Because when you think about it, it's like they got land out there in abundance. So because the, the, the land is out there in abundance, yes, you may have given away your daughter, but you can see your daughter over there. Like, I know that in, in, in some, on some of the Caribbean islands, people used to walk into other people's houses and just take out their kids. And the kid would go and live with them. But they would see, they would see the kid, they would see the, but the kid would be living at somebody else's house. Because they could better look after that child because you've got too many here. But you could see your child. But I think it's even it's still done today, like sending your child to university, you paying to train your child to become a slave for someone else or another company. You paying a lot of money or you putting your own child through debt. You're putting them in debt to be able to be trained to go and work for someone else. So I'm sure in a hundred years when people read about the things we do today, they'll be like, Yes, they're gonna be that's happen? crazy. Yeah. There's no way I would have done that. When yeah. you look at how much people are making on social media, it makes you question why would you go to medical school? It's, if yeah, you that's can ridiculous. Make what a doctor makes in a month, you can make yeah. on in Instagram. a week, a couple of days, in a couple of days, or that's a couple of minutes. Taking a photo in a bikini, you can yeah. make the same amount a doctor makes in a month. Yeah. Yeah. So that's... I built your house. Oh, that's my dad. Knowing. That's my Who dad. That's, that is my dad. That's my dad when he like you when when he got married to my mum. Because oh, I have I, that's that's the only pictures that you could that you'll find or that we'd be circulating around uh if people were to find when it came to my dad. And you might see that I've got very similar features. You do, him. he's a good looking guy. And did they he get was, married? They got married in London. They got married in London. They got married in a, in Paddington, an area known as Paddington. Is mm -hmm. where they um, got married, and that's him there, right there. That's him. What did Shirt he do? Work. Yeah, my dad was a he was a postman. Uh, yeah, but he was he 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 started he started out working working on London transport, and then he went on and he worked for the post office, and then he became the transport manager for the post office in Harlesden. Oh, nice. And what about this photo? That's my mum. That is that's my mum. Oh, that's, that's a beautiful dress. That is her when she when she when she came over. Um, it's hard to believe that she was a size eight. Because now she's about a size what twenty two, something like that. I love the dress. Okay. And she's a pretty woman as well. Okay. She's very beautiful. Because that's her on the right hand side and her sisters. And then that's dad, that's her dad in the middle.
So that's her in in a natural. Yeah, that's her. That's her in a natural element. But my thing is, is that as I've grown and I've learnt that South America is not where black people came from, not where African people came from. You know, it was the Arawak Indians who actually, because that's the lie when it comes to the Caribbean. I was told that the um, the African-looking people came from the Caribbean. They didn't. They were just put there um, because the Caribbean really, really was, all the islands were the equivalent of a factory that produces sugar, you know? Yeah. Uh -huh. This one. Hey, see, see, there's me in the middle. <laughs> so that's my youngest brother, Keith, on my left-hand side. And that's my eldest brother, Kelvin, on my right-hand side. Duh, and I've got a younger sister. I had a younger sister. That was with my mum and my dad. Um, and then I have two, uh, I've got a brother and a sister that my father had when my mother and father split up. Yes. What's happening that is Timbuktu. Here? That is the mud hut that they was telling us about. <laughs> that is the mud hut that they used to tell us about as children. And then when I discovered what a mud hut really looks like, I was like, you know what? You know, we're taking the piss because they would show us this little hovel of a thing. That when they were built with the mud, that's what they built, mate. That's Timbuktu. You know, I remember when my mum used to say to me, "I should lick you from here to Timbuktu," and I was like, "No, no, I don't want to go to Timbuktu." When I found out what Timbuktu was and where it was, that it was a university. They had university there. That they had reading. People used to read. The biggest commodity was books. I was like, I wish my mum did lick me to Timbuktu. <laughs> Hello, Comedy Cow. This is um, Rudy Liquid. Um, I apologise that I won't be at uh, Comedy Cow this evening. It's just that my wife gave me a surprise. <laughs> Birthday present. Um, and she flew me out to Marrakesh. Um, so Ori Styler will be replacing me this evening. Um, very, very engaging funny very funny engaging guy so once again it's really liquid saying i apologize and hopefully the guys will book me in for another date and i'll see you guys soon take care and bye that's that is me for that is me apologizing for having a birthday i was actually apologizing for having a birthday because my wife gave me a surprise present and um i just I, she just told me to get the suitcase and off we go so i got the suitcase and then off we go and then the next thing I knew was I got dates in the diary that I can't fulfill. So I had to send over an apology. You know, I, I, I'm going to be posting a video later because uh -huh. I had to, to organize my own surprise party. I had to oh, call my friend and tell her exactly oh, what to do for my surprise party. And then people, oh, maybe I should get myself oh. a wife. Because if you don't have a wife, <laughs> you don't get surprises. Oh, no. The vicinity, yeah. Apparently smoking some of that marijuana stuff. <laughs> We're gonna have to go out and do my duty. Someone's gonna get tasered around here. Someone's gonna get tasered. Been a long time since I shocked a little Negro. <laughs> that was a film and I was asked to play uh, a police officer in that film, whereby I was apprehending a couple of suspects. It was a pretty good film, pretty good film. Oh, nice. I'm, I'm definitely going to look out for it. And what can we expect uh, from Mr. Rudy? Where can we see you if we want to come and see your shows? I've got some shows here. Can you tell us about them and then you can tell us about where else we can follow you? Sure. Um, that's the Rants and Bants Comedy Club. That is a, I set that club up um, just in Northwest London in a place called Willesden. Um, you, can get, you can get to it via the Jubilee line. It's one. It's one. It's one of the many platforms that I wish to create for um, the circuit to grow and develop from. Really, uh, allowing new comedians, especially up and coming comedians, to meet comedians like yourself, man, who are seasoned, seasoned professionals. Um, so that's that young lady, for example. Her name is Natasha, Natasha Anderson. I'm coming through on the circuit company now, so she'll be meeting up with a Bonjo who is um, is a character comedian 
and he does a lot of work on both black and the white circuit. Yeah, the president. In fact, the character was so was so well taken by that um, one of the broadcasters tried to actually steal the character and create a program around him, and he had to get social media support from us guys to prevent that from happening. And the worst thing about it is they didn't then turn around and offer him the role and done and you know and pay him consultancy consultancy fee for writing about the character that he created jokes and business i thought um came up with the idea of this one because once again it's another platform but it's it's targeting a different market it's it's targeting the more um I guess uh, it's it's like work. People who want to network when it comes to when it comes to business, yeah. but and give them an outlet whereby they can meet in an environment that's not so corporate and still get business done. So you see, that's yeah. So you see, that's what I'm trying to do with Black Dish. I'm like, how can we? Can it be more than just a laugh? Can it? Can it? Can we do more things with it? I mean, one of the things we did with the comedy school was we took the comedy into um, young people's prisons, and we did workshops and things like that with them. Um, and it's also gone into the women's prisons as well. Literally telling them, "Come and kill us with laughter. Don't kill us with guns and knives." That's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> You can kill, but not the way you've been doing. Now, here's me. Um, this is called Blue Check Comedy. And I'm learning, or I'm, I just, I'm just, just, just run the business. Book the acts, just run the business. Yeah. I mean, we don't see who runs Sainsbury's. All right. So you shouldn't necessarily have to see. Rudy Liquid. So can Rudy Liquid step back and allow the comedy to do what it does? Because it is a business within itself. So here, I predominantly book white artists. Um, I, I, and, and But I'm there. I'm trying to draw myself off the stage. If one of your children wanted to do stand-up comedy, as a father, what would you say? You ain't funny, because I know you. You ain't funny. <laughs> Forget it, mate. Forget it. But I say you're university. We are going with. No. Um, if, they, if, they, if they were serious about it, I'd encourage, to be honest. I'd, I'd, you know, I'd encourage, I'd support. I'd use nepotism the way that white people do, you know, to get them the spots that they need. Um, ultimately, at, I know. Once you're on the stage, you're on your own. So your your own passion has to be driving you. I mean, what nobody really understands about us is just how far we're willing to go, and that's in travel. Just to get up for twenty minutes and then travel three hours back. You know, not everyone can do that. That comes from within. Yep. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate you giving me so much of your time. It really, it means a lot to me. Where can we follow you? Well, they, I've got, I'm, they can then straight away, if you put me into Facebook and you put Rudy Liquid, you will find me. Without a shot. And that's the same thing with Instagram. That's the same thing with LinkedIn. And that's the same thing with Twitter. I don't use Twitter so much. I don't like Twitter. I've got a Twitter account. I hardly ever use it. I tried to use it a little bit while I was in Edinburgh because my PR was like, you need to. But it's just not for me. Mm, mm. I think it's 170 odd characters or whatever it's supposed to do. But it's it's just not a medium that I'm 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 happy with working. I'm I'm pretty I'm pretty I'm I'm pretty okay with the Facebook, even though I've been told that I should be doing more on Instagram. I've started to put stuff on Twitter, but I forget to put stuff on Twitter because I'm so used to Instagram and Facebook. But I'm trying to embrace everything 
I'm, I'm, I'm still in the process of writing my book on the, the history of black British comedy. I've chronologically ordered, um, put it in order already. So I've got all the, the chapters in place. So now I'm, I'm filling it, filling in the blanks, as they say, with the help of chat GBT. Please make me feature in the GBT. book. Find a, find a way to, to put my name in the book. Yeah, you'll come, you'll come further down the line because you're in your, believe it or not, you're in what I call the new wave of comedians. Yeah. Because the thing is, is that not that I'm saying that, um, the ceiling hasn't been smashed, but you're one of those people who's going through this. Thank you so much, Rudy. Yeah. I, think I might have to, 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 when I edit this, I will put it as uh, two parts. Okay. Oh, it's that long. Part one Sorry. and part two. Oh, it's that long. Sorry. And it, no, it, but it's good. All of it is so good. And it was so necessary. Thank you so much. Really, really appreciate it. I will be putting all the links to your social media platforms. Uh, please, guys, do Thank support you. us because the best way you can support us as comedians is to follow us. Unfortunately, we do live in a time where numbers do matter because if it's not on the gram, it's a scam. They <laughs> want us to <laughs> the love you have for us through the numbers. So yes. if you're sitting at home, if you're yeah. watching this and thinking, oh, I like Rudy, but you're not following him. When the producers are coming, they're going to think, these people don't even like their own people because right. you guys need to do That's better right. when it comes to following That's us right. on social media. That's and we really do appreciate everyone who follows that. And uh, please don't forget to subscribe, like the video and share and That's leave fine. us a comment as well. And let us know, do you celebrate Black History Month? How do you celebrate it? And do you think Black history should be celebrated in one month do we need more or is one month enough or do we need less i'd like to hear your views and happy black history month to everyone thank you so much and i love you guys bye bye bye